In 2020, Nintendo is celebrating the 35th birthday of Super Mario in a wide range of ways. One of which is the resurrection of its classic Game & Watch line of handhelds, a piece of gaming history that even predates the birth of the famous Italian plumber himself. The genesis of the Game & Watch series is recounted in one of gaming's most famous anecdotes. According to legend, Nintendo engineer Gunpei Yokoi came up with the concept after observing a bored Japanese salaryman absentmindedly poking at the buttons of his pocket calculator while traveling to work. This seemingly innocent encounter ultimately gave birth to portable video gaming as we know it today. Unfortunately, Yokoi was tragically killed in a roadside incident in 1997, and although he would gain worldwide fame and adoration as the creator of the Game Boy, many view his earlier LCD legacy with the most fondness. Yokoi began his career with Nintendo all the way back in 1965, assuming the modest role of an assembly line engineer and was the brains behind the Ultra Hand, an extendable arm which sold more than 1.2 million units worldwide and would prove to be the first in a long long line of popular toys to spring from his bright and fertile imagination. Towards the end of the 70s, Nintendo started to disregard toys in favor of video games. And it was during this time that Yokoi had his aforementioned chance encounter with the bored businessman and his calculator. It was ideal timing. LCD technology was cheap and video games were big business. Fusing the two just made sense. It was during the development of the Game & Watch that Yokoi laid down principles of hardware design that would echo through Nintendo's history right up to the present day, dubbing it lateral thinking with withered technology. This basically meant taking mature technology and using it in new and innovative ways. The benefits were plain to see. Mature tech was well understood and components were cheap, which meant that the resultant products would be inexpensive from a manufacturing perspective. LCDs were commonplace at the time thanks to the pocket calculator boom. And while there was the temptation to use more advanced technology, Yokoi insisted that affordability and battery life were key considerations and that players were more concerned about enjoyable gameplay over cutting-edge flashy technology. Yokoi would later apply this philosophy to the production of the Game Boy, and Nintendo has taken a similar stance with subsequent systems such as the Nintendo DS, Wii, and even the Switch. Yokoi faced a tricky conundrum when it came to deciding upon the best interface for his new product. He quickly decided that a conventional joystick would impede on the Game & Watch's portability, so he began looking for solutions that would take up less space. Many of the early machines simply possessed a couple of buttons with which to control the game, usually corresponding to simple actions such as moving left and right or jumping. But 1982's Donkey Kong changed all that. It featured what we know now as the directional pad, or the D-pad. This was a development of truly seismic proportions, and without Game & Watch, the evolution of the traditional joypad would have been very different. There was also an element of convergence with this new range of handhelds. Although it seems like a trifling addition in today's technologically advanced world, the inclusion of a digital clock in each game, thus giving the rise to the name Game & Watch, was a major selling point back in the early 80s. Although LCD watches were commonly available, they were outside the reach of most children, so the Game & Watch was a useful device as well as a source of entertainment. A handy alarm feature was also available in units produced from 1981 onwards, which was probably added just to wake up the owner after a particularly heavy night of LCD gaming. Arguably, the most vital piece of the hardware puzzle was the choice of power source that would bring these tiny games to life. Yokoi opted for button cell batteries, previously seen in digital watches and calculators. Not only were these cheap to replace, they were also small and therefore fit snugly within the machines without breaking the sleek, straight lines of the casing or adding any additional weight that might hinder portability. Yokoi's desire to ensure his products would be inexpensive to run and not require a constant supply of fresh batteries played a vital part in ensuring the success of the range, a fact he was sure to remember when he came to create the Game Boy almost a decade later. But there was much more to the appeal of the Game & Watch range than just mere interface design and long-lasting power. 
because LCD technology granted the developers a very limited amount of on-screen real estate in which to place their action-packed gaming experiences, the games themselves tended to be extremely focused. Game designs were to the point and usually revolved around beating a high score. This ensured that, despite each title's simplicity, it would have enough appeal to encourage players to return time and time again. Mindful that each Game & Watch handheld could only offer one game due to the limiting nature of the LCD display, Nintendo decided to include two different difficulty settings for many of these products, and thereby increase their long-term appeal. Known as Game A and Game B, the player had to press the corresponding button before starting to play to decide which challenge they wished to face. Game B was usually a faster and more demanding variant of Game A. The first Game & Watch title was the simplistic Ball. Released in 1980, this endearingly basic game showed only faint glimmers of the kind of depth later Game & Watch titles would possess. Sales weren't astonishing, but the game seemed to strike a chord with consumers, and this was enough to persuade Nintendo that it was worth creating further titles. Ball marked the first release of the Silver series of Game & Watch titles, so-called because of the color of the metallic faceplate. The next step was the Gold series, which was fundamentally the same machine, but with a different faceplate and a smattering of static color on screen to make the game seem a little more vibrant, as well as the ability to set an alarm using the unit's built-in clock. The limitations of the LCD display meant that Nintendo was always looking for ways to innovate, and of course, the next logical step was to add another screen to double the amount of gameplay each title could potentially offer. The multi-screen series, as it was known, kicked off with Oil Panic in 1982, but it was the release of Donkey Kong that really cemented the success of the range. Easily the biggest selling of all the Game & Watch titles up to that point, Donkey Kong was a startlingly faithful representation of the arcade smash hit. Iconic in design, the multi-screen range would go on to be a major influence in the creation of the clamshell Game Boy Advance SP and the Nintendo DS many years later, with the latter system even copying the dual screen concept. Releasing in 1983, the Game & Watch tabletop system was something of a departure from the norm. It sacrificed portability for more impressive color visuals and ran off bulky C batteries. Ugh. Sales of this machine were steady, but nowhere near as impressive as its widescreen and multi-screen cousins, and therefore only four tabletop titles were ever produced, Donkey Kong Jr., Mario's Cement Factory, Snoopy, and Popeye. A refinement of the technology resulted in the more mobile Panorama series a few months later which used a fold-out mirror to enhance the vacuum fluorescent display. Again, these didn't sell as well as the LCD Game & Watch titles, and only six games were released. Snoopy, Popeye, Donkey Kong Jr., Mario's Bombs Away, Mickey Mouse, and Donkey Kong Circus. Which, I have to point out, I have no idea who thought it was a good idea to give Donkey Kong his own circus, but here we are. Despite the tabletop and panorama ranges failing to reach the same heights as their LCD siblings, Nintendo was clearly keen to add some color to the range, and this culminated in 1984's Super Color range, which used an LCD display with a color overlay to give the impression of color visuals. Sadly, only two games were ever produced, Spitball Sparky and Crab Grab, making this the least successful entry in the Game & Watch canon. However, it didn't dampen Nintendo's desire to experiment. Sensing that gaming was also a social pastime, Nintendo decided to publish the Micro vs. series in the same year, which offered simultaneous two-player action thanks to a pair of small controllers stored within the body of the unit itself, a feature which calls to mind the detachable Joy-Con on the Switch, which would arrive many years later. Punch-Out, Donkey Kong 3, and Donkey Kong Hockey were the three titles in this range. 1986 saw yet another hardware revision, and one that proved to be the last. The legendary Crystal Screen Machines. These were more traditional games in keeping with the widescreen style, but they possessed a transparent LCD display. Sadly, these screens were highly susceptible to damage. Marketed as a luxury item, the range didn't quite achieve the same kind of fame as the more traditional widescreen games, which by this point had been relaunched under the snappy title of New Widescreen. As the decade drew to a close, the seemingly vast reserves of innovation began to run dry, but it was ultimately Yokoi himself that would deal the death blow to his beloved pocket-sized offspring. 
Zelda, the penultimate release in the range, hit the shelves in 1989, the same year as Yokoi's newest pet project, the Game Boy. It was instantly obvious that the writing was on the wall for the video game and clock combo. The very last entry in the series was a loving homage to the game that started it all, 1991's Mario the Juggler, recycled the gameplay from Ball, but showcased gorgeous screen artwork. Although several classic Game & Watch titles would be transformed into key rings in the late 90s as part of the Nintendo Mini Classics line, these were merely licensed by Nintendo rather than produced in-house. It was the end of an era, but with the more complex Game Boy and Game Boy Color handhelds wooing gamers the world over, few seem to mourn the passing of the Game & Watch line. More recently, Game & Watch units have risen sharply in value as collectors gobble up anything that appears on secondary markets like eBay. Should the idea of splashing out loads of cash on original machines not appeal to you, then you can always invest in one of the excellent compilation packages that were released for Nintendo's Game Boy machines. The series made its debut in 1994 in Europe and Australia, bizarrely, with Game Boy Gallery, complete with a particularly dreadful box art. The sequel, Game & Watch Gallery, followed in 1997 and tied in more closely with the LCD originals. It was also thankfully granted a global release. The third and fourth games were released on the Game Boy Color in 98 and 99 respectively, and a Game Boy Advance installment hit the shelves in 2002. In many cases, the games featured in these collections were visually upgraded variants of the originals. Sticking with the Game Boy hardware, the Game Boy Camera came with a version of Ball which allowed you to place your own face on the body of the main character, while the Nintendo e-reader, which launched for the Game Boy Advance back in 2002, was bundled with a version of Manhole. There were plans to make more Game & Watch titles available, but they sadly never came to fruition. More recently, Nintendo has released the Game & Watch Collection and Game & Watch Collection 2 for the Nintendo DS, which was sadly limited to members of the now-defunct Club Nintendo service. And between them, they featured the titles Oil Panic, Greenhouse, Donkey Kong Parachute, and Octopus. Furthermore, the Japan-only Japanese-to-English dictionary, Kanji Sonomama, had secret versions of Ball, Judge, Flagman, and Manhole, while 2006's Personal Trainer Cooking contained versions of Chef and Egg. Starting from 2009, Nintendo also re-released several Game & Watch titles individually for its now-defunct DSiWare service. For fans of truly obscure Game & Watch releases, the Japan-exclusive Nintendo DS TV tuner accessory came with three games, Octopus, Fire, and Lion, and it appears there were plans to allow more down the road. With the release of the Mario Bros. Game & Watch in 2020 to celebrate the 35th anniversary of the series, there is renewed interest in the Game & Watch range, and it's relatively easy to understand why. These pocket-sized games are from a period before many Nintendo fans were even born, and despite their humble gameplay and primitive technology, they're wonderfully tactile objects which have almost become works of art in their own way. Could we see Nintendo release more modern Game & Watch handhelds in the future? Well, it's Zelda's 35th next year, so who knows?